Today's show is brought to you by ExpressVPN. Protect your online activity today and find out how you can get three months free at tryexpressvpn.com slash space. That's tryexpressvpn.com slash space for three months free with a one-year package. Visit tryexpressvpn.com slash space to learn more. 15 seconds. Guidance is internal. 10, 9... Sequence Space Nuts. 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Space Nuts. Astronauts report it feels good. Hello again, and thank you for joining us on the final edition of Space Nuts ever this year. And uh, thank you for your company. Episode 134. Didn't mean to scare you. Uh, my name's Andrew Dunkley, uh, your host, and joining me, astronomer at large, Fred Watson. Hello, Fred. Hi, <laughs> Andrew. Uh, the very last ever episode for 2018. Indeed. <laughs> Where's yes. the year gone? I don't know. I looked under the carpet. And yeah, yeah. The Somewhere door, like that. Couldn't find it. It's just the way it goes. Uh, I think the cat ran away with it, actually. Yeah, and the dog ate it. <laughs> um, yes, but uh, we, we farewell 2018 and bring on 2019. We'll be taking a couple of weeks off. We'll talk about that later. But uh, before then, we're looking at the New Horizons rendezvous with uh, Ultima Thule. And uh, next year, uh, the activities of Virgin Galactic uh, and a couple of big anniversaries. Well, one in particular, Apollo missions celebrating 50 years. That's Apollo 11. And that's really exciting. And, of course, um, something else that's happening next year, 100 hours of astronomy. That's why we never find anything, because we haven't got enough time. And a couple of questions from the audience. Why is the moon upside down and why does everything in the universe spin? Um, Basic questions, but interesting answers. So we will investigate all of those, Fred, and we'll start with New Horizons and its upcoming rendezvous. Indeed. (laughs) So New Horizons, to cast your memory back, uh, New Horizons flew by the dwarf planet Pluto back in 2015, the 14th of July, a date that's etched on all the minds of planetary scientists around the world. Because it was such an absolute triumph, uh, the uh, spacecraft uh, basically buzzed, um, buzzed Pluto because the, you know, it was traveling at 14 kilometers per second. There's no chance of stopping it or slowing it to go into orbit. Uh, and it, it was traveling that fast because it was one of the fastest spacecraft ever sent out in the solar system. And the reason for that is because it's got to travel further than uh, most of the other ones, at least in the shortest possible time. So a great triumph in Pluto. We learned lots about the dwarf planet Pluto. Uh, and then shortly afterwards, the trajectory was adjusted to uh, allow New Horizons to fly by uh, an object that then was only recently discovered. It was only discovered the year before the Pluto encounter, uh, 2014. Known technically as 2014 MU69, it's now been nicknamed Ultima Thule. I don't think it is yet uh, a a formally approved name, but that that name is an ancient name that refers to the furthest possible thing you can know. Um, People used to use it in connection with places like Iceland and Greenland, but now we use it in connection with places on the fringes of the solar system. So uh, to cut to the chase, it is going to pass by Ultima Thule on the first day of 2019. Um, that's, I think, in, uh, in UT it's that day, or it may even be uh, US time. Uh, we, we in Australia will probably not see uh, any real you know, results from it or anything like that until the 2nd at, at the earliest, uh, 2nd of January. But the, the flyby is on New Year's Day. Uh, and it's interesting because the object in question, Ultima Thule, it's a tiny little um, basically icy asteroid. It's about, um, uh, if I remember rightly, it's about uh, 30 kilometres or thereabouts across. Uh, That is correct. It's about 30 kilometres. That's an estimate because you, it's so far away and so, you know, small in the sky in terms of its angular size that it's very difficult to estimate its size. You can't measure it directly. You've got to do it in terms of brightness yeah, and things it'd be, like that. It'd be almost like trying to hone in on a grain of sand across a continent, wouldn't it? Um, when you talk the distances and sizes of objects. Yeah. 
Yeah, exactly. Amazing. That's a good, an, an, uh, good analogy. Um, so uh, it, it's been in the news actually in the last couple of days because NASA has uh, what they've done is that they're being concerned about the possibility of. Uh, you know, a dust cloud surrounding Ultima Thule, or even maybe rings or something like that. Mm. Uh, obstructions, small moons, things of that sort. We believe it does have a moon. Uh, but uh, so they've, what they've done is they've um, used the, uh, there's a, basically one of the cameras uh, on board, the, um, the Long Range Reconnaissance Imager, or LORI, that's the, it's basically a telescope on, on board the spacecraft. Uh, and they've taken many, many images over the last uh, few days to, to check whether anything has shown up. Because um, the, the two weeks out from the rendezvous is the time when you would want to do a course correction. If you've realized that there was a lot of dust around yeah. uh, you needed to avoid, then you, you do a course correction now, and it means you pass uh, at a more safe distance from the object. Uh, they've decided that was unnecessary because there's been no sign of any material around uh, Ultima Thule. And so um, it's basically taking the inside track. Uh, it will pass within about 3,000 uh, um, kilometers of uh, of the object. Uh, I think that's correct. Uh, which is, I think it's 3,300, 3,500 kilometers, mm. which is actually a third of the distance that it flew by Pluto. And you remember the detail that we saw? Oh, yes. Pluto images. So this is going to be three times closer. Uh, and um, we should see detail at a level of, you know, a few tens of of, uh, of meters. Actually, they, they're, they're suggesting 30 to 70 meters per pixel uh, for the images that we will see. So all is working well. Uh, it's in good shape. The spacecraft seems to have a clear path forward uh, without any kind of risk of collisions with dust particles, because at 14 kilometers per second, a dust particle can do a lot of damage. Yeah. Uh, I'm very much looking forward to what we discover. We really have no idea what this thing will look like. It's, it's just an icy you know, a small icy asteroid. It's probably, uh, it, it's probably shaped a bit like uh, that. That you know, you remember the rubber duck shaped comet? Yes, yes, it's, that's right. Uh, it may well have a similar shape to that because it's thought to be possibly two objects very close together or an elongated object. Uh, all will be revealed, we hope, in about a fortnight. So mm. we're well, looking forward to it. Indeed, we'll report on that uh, in the new year, but I uh, wouldn't be surprised if they spot a McDonald's or a Walmart on there. <laughs> uh, but we will watch and wait with interest uh, and um, report on that intercept uh, after it's occurred and the pictures start to come through. Now, Fred, uh, Virgin Galactic has uh, been you know, talking up their plans for, well, quite a few years now, but um, they're, they're on the verge, are they, uh, of getting... A bit further the, down the path in 2019, on the verge of virginity. Can yeah. I put it? Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, for, yeah. They, so look, um, I, if ever there was a time when you'd feel optimistic about the, the you know, Richard Branson's uh, uh, comments that we'll be we'll be flying next year, uh, I think this is it. Uh, he's been saying they'll be taking fair paying passengers next year for about the last five years, I think. Uh, but, the, you know, I'm, I do um, admire the care that has been taken with this project because they, they are clearly um, putting in place such technical um, know-how in order to safeguard the passengers that they hope will flock to the project. Um, and I'm sure uh, the, the wealthy people of the world will indeed flock to it. So uh, why is Virgin? Why is that uh, optimism uh, showing up now at the end of 2018? Because they've made their first flight into space. Depending on quite how you define space, they mm. uh, they flew the rocket plane up to 82 kilometers above the Mojave Desert, uh, which uh, some definitions of the edge of space actually say 80 kilometers. But the the, the standard one is the Kármán limit, uh, which is eight, uh, which is 100 kilometers. And that's what uh, Virgin Galactic is aiming at. But uh, I think they were pretty happy with their flight to 80, uh, 82 kilometers uh, with two test pilots on board and a dummy passenger, I think, if I remember rightly. Uh, 
so just um, a quick recap of the way this works. Virgin Galactic has a sort of two-stage system for space tourism. Uh, they have a, a, a large jet aircraft, an unusual one, which they call the mothership, yep. uh, and that carries slung beneath its wing uh, uh, the rocket plane itself, which can carry six passengers. Uh, the jet takes it up to about 12 kilometers high, uh, and then the rocket plane is released and it fires its rocket motor and off it goes up to the edge of space. Um, when the motor burns out, I think it's a 60 second burn, uh, with, I can't remember the G's, it's something like one and a half to two G's, something of that sort of additional acceleration. The, the, uh, it's in free fall for about three or four minutes, so as it reaches its apogee, um, giving you a beautiful view of the curvature of the Earth, and indeed we saw that with some of the pictures that uh, Virgin Galactic sent back uh, last week. Uh, and then it, it glides back to Earth. There's a deceleration, which I think is quite a lot more than the acceleration, uh, and it lands like a glider uh, at uh, Spaceport America, where um, Marley and I have been, we've actually stood on the runway there, and it was very big and very empty at the time. This is four years ago. Yeah. Um, so uh, a, a big triumph for, for Branson and the Virgin Galactic team to get this first flight into space. Um, I think we'll see more ramping up during 2019, and maybe before the end of the year, we will see fair-paying passengers. Um, it, there's still a bit of a race between uh, Elon Musk and his SpaceX, because they're doing space tourism as well, and Jeff Bezos, who has a company called Blue Origin that you and I have spoken about before. They both, both uh, Blue Origin and SpaceX, of course, use vertically launched spacecraft and recover their boosters afterwards. So mm. uh, two completely different technologies from, from, the, uh, from the Virgin Galactic. I think Richard Branson's winning the race in terms of naming spaceships after <laughs> what we uh, heard the other day with Elon Musk's naming. Uh, yes. But um, the VSS Unity, Virgin Spaceship Unity, I, I do quite like that. Yeah, it's pretty good, isn't it? Yeah, not bad at all. And it reached 2.9 times the speed of sound, yep. uh, which is pretty schmick. And the other thing that I found interesting is that the, the pilots, um, Mark Stuckey and Rick um, Stokow, Stokow, Stokow uh, will be awarded commercial astronaut wings. Yeah, that's right. So Indeed. That's a thing. <laughs> yes, in fact, it's, they're probably among the first. Um, one of those two guys, uh, Rick Sturkov, or Sturko, uh, is actually a, a former NASA astronaut. I think he flew the shuttle a few times. So uh, he's actually he's got his wings already, but the commercial astronaut wings is a different thing. It is, yeah. Wow. Uh, and it's official. It's through the Federal Aviation Administration, so it's not yeah, just, sort yeah. of, you know, you don't go to Walmart and buy them. They, well, you probably could. <laughs> but um, <laughs> they, they will indeed be um, officially presented with those. So um, yeah, that's, pretty, cool. that's pretty cool. What are they for? Oh, I flew the VSS Unity, man. Cool. <laughs> Very cool. Anyway, uh, we will hear more about that, no doubt. You're listening to Space Nuts with Andrew Dunkley and Fred Watson. Now, let's take a little break and find out more about our sponsor, ExpressVPN, rated number one by Tech Radar. Uh, this is the one I use. I've been using it for a couple of years, and I love it. When I joined ExpressVPN, they were, they were brand new, uh, new to the market, but uh, I read a lot of reviews and did a lot of comparisons, and there was just something about their, their business model that I particularly liked and a couple of years down the track honestly can't complain their interface is very easy to use their their service is second to none uh, I've had to contact them a couple of times about um, certain things that I wanted to do and they were brilliant so you may be wondering why I do need a VPN at all it's all about privacy uh, do you really want big tech companies governments and others knowing uh, what's going on with your online activity. Even if you're having nothing to hide, it just feels downright creepy. Uh, I think you'll agree. And governments are getting more and more interested in what you're doing every day. And so, yeah, protecting your privacy is what VPN is all about. And how often do you uh, run across websites that you want to get information from only to find that they're geo-blocked? 
This is becoming an increasing problem, but ExpressVPN solves that problem for you. Uh, now, if you go to our special URL, you'll see quite a list of things this service can help you with, things you may never have thought of before. As I say, it's the one I use, secure, fast, and it just works. Uh, so protect yourself online today and find out more about how to get three months free at tryexpressvpn.com slash space. That's T-R-Y-E-X-P-R-E-S-S-V-P-N dot com slash space for three months free with a one year package. Try expressvpn.com slash space to learn more and you'll find the link details in the show notes and on our website. Now... Back to the show. Zero G and I feel fine. Space nuts. Now, Fred, we looked at what's happening very early next year on the 1st of January, in fact, with that flyby. But uh, there's a, a couple of other things that are happening next year that are certainly worth um, putting into your diary, and, and that will be the 50th anniversary of the Apollo landing on uh, the moon, Apollo 11. Uh, I can't believe it's 50 years, but it's coming up in July, and that will be very exciting. A lot of nostalgia, a lot of people with stories to tell, and still a lot of people around who were there and who were involved or directly involved or um, or just watched it on TV like me. <laughs> Indeed, that's right. Um, so uh, the Apollo anniversary, um, 20th of July, of course, um, I, I, I think uh, we're only really just starting at this stage to see the, the ramping up of the celebratory events for the Apollo anniversary. Uh, there is uh, a NASA website, which is Apollo 50th uh, slash events dot HTML. That's one to look for. You can find it on the NASA, the NASA web pages. It's an easy link to find. Um, so uh, the, the, there's a number of events listed uh, in that. For example, on the 24th of January 2019, uh, the US Mint will release the Apollo 11 50th anniversary commemorative coins. So, you know, Shocker. in many ways. Gee, that's a commemorative the... coin, that's, that's different. I know I'm <laughs> being a bit cheeky, but um, Australia releases a commemorative coin for the opening of an envelope. So, we, you know, this is, yeah. this is no surprise to me. Yeah, there's, look, there's, there's, there's plenty going on. Uh, there's something called an Apollo Palooza uh, in the Space Museum in Denver, a regional celebration of the 50th anniversary of the moon landing and future human space exploration. Uh, there's uh, an Apollo celebration gala in the Saturn V Center, the Kennedy Space Center oh, in Florida. Oh, I've been there. Oh, uh, I want to go back for that. That is such well, a good, cool, that's an amazing place. If you I, go on the 16th of July, uh, you can put your fancy clothes on because that's when the celebration gala takes place. Oh, when you walk in that room, you just go, is that what I think it is? <laughs> They've got a sat <laughs> yeah, sure rocket right. hanging from the ceiling. I mean, that's unbelievable. Um, so I'm getting very excited, Fred. Very excited. Yeah, well, it, it, it's a place I haven't been to and I will very much like to go, but um, we, we'll all be there in spirit anyway mm. during the, um, the, the week of Apollo celebrations. Uh, there's a summer moon festival in um, a little place called Wapakoneta in Ohio. Do you know why that's famous? <laughs> uh, because that's where Neil Armstrong comes from? Exactly so, that's right, yeah. That's the place. So they've got lots of things going on there, uh, celebrating the 50th anniversary exhibits, demonstrations, activities about historic and future lunar exploration. So there will be a lot going on, and we will try and keep our listeners posted on, on all that throughout the year. And his famous neighbour, Mr Gorski. Of course, of course. yes. I, I, I knew you'd bring Mr Gorski. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to explain it. You have to look it up yourself. Check it out. Yeah, mm. that's right. Yeah, it's not fit for broadcast, basically. <laughs> <laughs> so two um, sort of major anniversaries in 2019, the Apollo 50th and the 100th birthday of an organisation nobody has ever heard of. <laughs> well, let's hear it. Why is that a big thing? The International Astronomical Union is 100 years old. Oh, wow. Uh, best known, of course, for... Uh, reclassifying Pluto as a dwarf planet rather than a planet. Yeah, so that was sort of one of their biggest um, 
<laughs> out there kind of decisions and very, very controversial, much. very yeah. controversial. Yeah, it's uh, not often a body like that has makes decisions that are controversial, but that one certainly was. And of course, the headlines ran hot. Um, I've told, I've mentioned before that the headline I really loved was the the one because uh, they met in Prague. Uh, and it, the headline, it was in a newspaper in uh, Newcastle, in, in New South Wales, Pluto dumped by the Uber nerds of Prague. <laughs> yeah. so the IAU are the Uber nerds. And, <laughs> that's a river. You know, um, oh, that's great. They're celebrating, yeah, celebrating their 100th birthday. There is an IAU 100 website if you want to have a look, if you're interested. It's just www.iau-100.org. Uh, the first event actually throughout the year is going to be something called 100, 100 Hours of Astronomy, which has been done before. It's uh, uh, you know, a period of 100 hours where you, uh, lots of people coordinate amateur and professional astronomers and astronomy enthusiasts and the general public, all basically uh, invited to share their knowledge and enthusiasm and reading this for, for space by taking part in a scheduled activity or organizing one of their own as part of the 100 Hours of Astronomy event. So that's the kind of thing that's happening. Uh, 100 Hours of Astronomy is more a bit more relevant in the Northern Hemisphere, uh, where it's dark in January uh, and the, the nights are long mm. uh, here. Of course, uh, in the south, the nights are short, and uh, people's minds tend to be on the beach rather than astronomy. But we'll we'll have events uh, here in Australia, and so there'll be IAU 100 events throughout the year. A few global uh, projects. There's a something called the Einstein Schools Global Project, which is connecting schools worldwide to to study the role that gravity plays, um, and you know, uh, do it in a creative and and hopefully original way. So all that sort of thing is going on. Uh, if you're interested in this, it's very easy to find information on the IAU 100 website. And once again, I think as the year progresses, you'll see more and more things happening on there. Yeah, and I think the youth of today are seeing space in a completely different light to when I was growing up. It was an intangible then, and uh, getting into space and getting to the moon was just the most difficult and incredible thing that you could do. And, of course, now yeah. we've got so many countries and so many people who've been up and down and around the planet. Uh, you, you could run into them in the street now and you wouldn't, that you wouldn't know them. But back then you were just famous for the rest of your life for just yes. doing that one thing um, yeah. and and still so because they're the pioneers but um, now it's just um, you know it, it's more of a matter of fact scenario and, and it, it's just going to get more and more like that as time goes on I mean I, 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 fo right. I foresee the day where you say to someone what do you do oh, I work on a space station oh yeah right oh yeah <laughs> It's I do boring. see that. I do see that being, you know, as as well, mundane as 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 working a radio desk. <laughs> yeah, which actually to a lot of people would seem pretty glamorous as well, Andrew. It ain't. Sense. Believe me, it's not. <laughs> yeah, it's a, I know it is those. fun though. It is a lot yeah. of fun. Mm. Yeah. But yeah, I'm really looking forward to the 50th anniversary events for uh, uh, Apollo. I probably won't get over there to be involved in any of them unless I get a special invitation and a first class ticket. But I. Um, I, I really can't wait for that anniversary because it'll rekindle a lot of memories for me. I remember getting sent home from school. I was, uh, what, seven years old, I think, yeah, and uh, sitting there and watching it on TV, and it was like early afternoon in Australia when they touched down and, um, and got off. Uh, so, um, yeah, awesome stuff, awesome stuff. And, uh, and big connections with Australia in the coverage uh, through the... Uh, radio telescopes etc uh, so yeah pretty exciting times uh, you're much. listening to Space Nuts uh, Andrew Dunkley here with of course Fred Watson Okay, we checked all four systems and King with a go. Space Nuts. Finally, Fred, we're going to tackle a couple of questions. This first one comes from Stuart in Springwood in New South Wales and he said recently I was in LA and the moon was half full with the light side on the top at the four o'clock position. Um, I contacted my son in Sydney and asked him to also take a photo at the same time. Uh, we compared, um, the Sydney photo had the light on the seven o'clock position, the moon appeared diametrically opposed to LA. Conclusion, the earth is round, am I correct? Yes. <laughs> okay, thanks for your question, Stuart. We'll move on to the next one. There's a, there, there is actually a little bit more to say about this, oh, Andrew. Okay. 
um, <laughs> because um, that one's fooled me as well. Uh, on my very, very first visit to Australia back in 1978, 40 years ago, uh, I was flying down from the, the UK to use the Anglo-Australian telescope to observe some faint stars near the center of our galaxy. And of course, to observe faint stars, you need dark time, which you need means you need a full moon. Uh, and I had done all my calculations and applied for the time and I'd got dark time, I'd got time when the moon is, is, is new, uh, and so was flying down. But I looked out the window of the aircraft in the last leg coming into Sydney and the moon was in the sky. And to my northern hemisphere eyes, it looked as though it was at first quarter, uh, which means that it's getting bigger and it would be full in a week's time. And it, it took me full 10 minutes to convince myself that the reason why it looked like that was because it was upside down. Mm. Um, I was seeing it from a vantage point quite different from mine. It really gave me a shock seeing it like that, thinking, God, it's the first quarter. I'm doomed. I've made all my calculations wrong. I'm going to get to Siding Spring and the moon will be full and we won't see anything. But it wasn't like that. It was just me not thinking straight. And probably the jet lag had already kicked in because I'd been sitting in that plane for about 20 hours already. So the simple answer is that because you moved pretty well from one point to the almost exact opposite point on Earth, everything just was the other way up. Yeah, that's right. It's just the other way up. Exactly. Mm. Yeah. So that's the simple <laughs> explanation, Stuart. I mean, it's as simple as, you know, turning something over. And, and Stuart's, Stuart's got it right, absolutely. Conclusion, yeah. the Earth is round. Yes. yes, well, there's still a lot of argument going on about that. But um, <laughs> we did cover that very, very um, significantly uh, earlier this year because we got a question about it. How do we prove that yes, the right. uh, Earth is round? And, and as you said, it's the, the shadow of the Earth on the moon. If the Earth was flat, there wouldn't be a crescent shadow. It would that well. If there was, it would look different next time. The thing about the the, the shadow of the Earth on the Moon is that it it always looks the same shape. Yeah, it's because it's a spherical object. So we thought we'd revisit that one. <laughs> uh, we'll move on to the next question. This one's from uh, Peter uh, Hindwood. Uh, why does everything in the universe spin? A very short, succinct question, uh, but a very good one. It is. It's a great question, um, and it's it's tied up with um, the, really the mechanisms uh, with which you know by which things are formed in the universe, and and it sort of goes back really to the Big Bang itself, which was uh, you know left the, the universe full of this glowing plasma, and as it cooled, uh, we we had huge clouds of both hydrogen and this stuff called dark matter that we don't really understand. We know it's some sort of subatomic particle uh, which outweighs normal matter by five to one. Uh, but we think that uh, clouds of dark matter were the seeds of galaxies. They were what formed galaxies. And of course, galaxies rotate uh, along with ev everything else. Uh, and the, the bottom line is, if you imagine, uh, no matter what you're imagining the formation of, but let's take stars for an example, because that, that's, that's a, a good example. If you imagine a blob of gas and and dust, uh, just this huge, um, you know, amorphous blob, uh, it will start to collapse under its own gravity. Uh, and that's how we think this is what we think is the, the beginning of the formation of stars and indeed galaxies. Um, but stars and planets are a good, a good example to use. So this, this blob starts collapsing. Um, it will have within it little eddies of rotation. So r rotating bits of the blob. And as it collapses, they are intensified and what happens is that you know some of these eddies will be rotating one way some will be rotating the other they'll all be mixed up but the average rotation is not zero There's, there'll be a slight preponderance of rotation in one direction than there is in the other and as the collapse takes place that becomes the prevailing rotation of this blob of gas and as it turns into um, a star and what's called a protoplanetary disk, a disk of dust and gas surrounding it, that rotation is then kind of firmly embedded that, you know, what you've got there is the, the fossil remains of the, um, the, the, the average rotation of the original gas cloud. Um, 
The, the other thing about rotation, of course, is it's what keeps objects in place because we, in our rotation around the uh, around the sun, we we are experiencing this balance between gravity and our velocity around uh, around the sun in our orbit. Um, the, the the other thing to say about this is in the solar system. Pretty well everything rotates in the same direction. Not quite, but almost everything. If you're looking at the, at the solar system from above the Earth's North Pole, the rotation is anti-clockwise. So the planets are going anti-clockwise. Their rotation in, in general is anti-clockwise. And once again, that's the same reason. It's the, it's the fossilized remains of the spin of the gas cloud itself from which the solar system formed. So um, the reason why everything spins is because uh, it's a kind of almost inevitable part of the process of either galaxy formation or star formation or planetary formation. It's the fossil remains of the original rotation. Is there an experiment you can do on Earth to sort of prove it? I mean, I'm thinking if you tick it, tip out a bucket of dust and it hits the ground, you watch the plume and it, it spins out. Yes, that's right. Yeah, the, the, the belittle eddy is in that. And mm. it, it's, it's, the, it's the effect of the collapse that sort of stamps that rotation on whatever it is that you're doing. Uh, there is an experiment that you can do that kind of highlights that, and it's the famous well-known uh, conservation of angular momentum experiment. You get a rotating office chair, uh, you sit on it. I'm and on one now. All right. Well, you can do this experiment <laughs> as we speak. Uh, just watch out, though. You need a bit of space. Um, if you spin yourself round with your legs stretched out, uh, you, you'll rotate. But if you then pull your legs in, um, you, your rotation will increase because you're, um, you're, you're collapsing your legs. You're getting nearer the center of... The ballerina you know, effect. You're doing the ballerina effect. That's yes. right. Yeah, that's I'm not going to try it here because there's just there's nowhere near enough room for me to spin Mandu or me. To yeah, yeah. <laughs> I could just imagine empty waste bins getting knocked over and all the rest of it. Yeah. There. The tea flying off the desk. Radio <laughs> stations are not known for their space. No, indeed. Which is That's ironic it. given what we talk about here. Yes, but, indeed. Uh, mm. yeah. yeah, so everything spins because of um, you know, the effects the, of... Well, angular momentum is yeah. the bottom. That's, that's, the, that's the answer. The collapse of angular momentum. <laughs> I hope that answers your question, Peter. Uh, there are some exceptions, um, as, as Fred said. What was? Uh, is there one in our solar system that spins awkwardly? Is it Neptune? Yeah. So, so Uranus is. Oh, Uranus. Is on, yeah. Kind of on its side. Venus also has a peculiar spin too. Um, so th that probably means they've been modified during the history of the solar system. You know, we think Uranus spins on its side because something big clouted it um, only a few million years after it was formed uh, and knocked it over. Mm. So that would, yeah, so those would be unusual exceptions, but there'd be some direct influence to cause that. So yes, that's right. in, in terms yeah, of not... normality, they'd probably started out like everything else. That's probably true, mm. yes. Okay, Peter, hope that answers your question. Thank you so much for uh, sending it in, and Stuart uh, as well. Um, with the question about the upside down moons. Um, we appreciate it. And thank you so much for, uh, for all the questions that have come in this year. We, we, we love them. We love the feedback. We get photos. We get all sorts of things uh, from people all over the world. And it's terrific. And thank you for supporting our podcast and, and continuing to follow us because uh, our numbers are growing and that's really encouraging. And uh, it, it certainly makes us want to turn up next week. And... Uh, <laughs> And we will. Well, no, actually, we won't. Not next week. We're going to take a couple of weeks off. We'll be back. Uh, we're thinking around uh, the 10th of January. Um, bigger and better. No, we'll be exactly the same. Uh, but thank, thank you, Fred, for all your hard work. I know you've uh, you put a lot of time and effort into this, and uh, I personally appreciate it. But I, I think um, the people who follow our podcast appreciate it too. And uh, we, we look forward to um, going onward and upward in 2019. Indeed. Yes, upward might be where we're going, especially with Vir Virgin Galactic. Fingers Thanks crossed. Again, we Andrew. might be able to do a podcast from, um, Who from knows? the Ultima. You never know. <laughs> Uh, and yeah, once again, thanks for your perseverance and um, and your good humour throughout our long conversations about things astronomical. And we all look forward to a successful and peaceful 2019. Indeed. 
Thank you, Fred. And uh, thank you, Marnie. And thank you, everybody. And we will catch you again on the very next episode of Space Nuts. Space Nuts. You've been listening to the Space Nuts podcast. Subscribe to the full podcast on iTunes, Audio Boom, and Stitcher, or your favourite podcast distributor. This has been another quality podcast production from Sites.com.